We're here today talking with a group of researchers from the Connected Learning Lab at UC Irvine and specifically wanting to look into the work that they've done around youth connections for well-being and social media and understanding um, the research that's been done in this area and specifically some applications that we could have for um, families and educators and practitioners in this area. So um, let's go ahead and start with a little bit of background. Uh, Mimi, if you could tell us what was the impetus for this work and what brought the three of you together to do it? So I think the underlying impetus was really that we see a lot of growing interest and concern about young people's use of digital technology, both in terms of their learning uh, and their social development, as well as in terms of their uh, psychological well-being um, and mental health. And, you know, it was really a unique opportunity because I think what's happening right now is a growing uh, understanding of the overlap between what educational research calls social-emotional learning and what in the health area uh, people have been studying and uh, researching for quite some time around well-being. Uh, and the digital is sort of a point of shared concern across those two fields. And we're very lucky at the Connected Learning Lab to have uh, research and practice and design expertise that is right at that intersection. So it was a great opportunity for us uh, when we saw funders starting to support uh, work at this intersection as well to catalyze new collaborations at the lab. That's great. So you mentioned the different uh, points of expertise that you all bring to this. So maybe we should just take a minute and go into that. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you've worked on to date? Sure, uh, I'm happy to start. So I am a, a learning scientist and a cultural anthropologist by training. So most of my work actually has been around studying how young people are learning uh, in the kind of learning they do for fun with new technology, like in digital game communities and fan fiction communities, uh, making remix videos and anime and trying to decode that digital youth culture for educators so they can harness some of that uh, social, peer-to-peer, -peer, and digitally enabled learning for uh, project-based and interest-driven and truly student-centered forms of learning. It sounds like you are researching the kind of learning that most kids hope they can do more of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have fun. Yeah, for sure. Candace, how about you? What's your background? Yeah, so I'm a developmental and quantitative psychologist, and so that essentially means I study children's development, and so I'm interested in how kids' social, emotional, and their mental health evolves over time, and I'm also a quantitative psychologist, so I spend a lot of time with large data sets or collecting large amounts of data on children, and um, I got into this area at the intersection of digital technology and, and child and adolescent mental health, because we're just interested in the factors and the context that influence children's mental health. And given how much time they're spending in digital spaces, it just became the elephant in the room. So how can we not pay attention? Um, and Stephen, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your background. I'm a clinical psychologist and a mental health service researcher. And what that means is that I both study the development of effective psychosocial treatments as well as ways to get those treatments out to the people who need them. Um, a lot of my work focuses on improving access to and accessibility of mental health treatments through technology. And I use those two different words intentionally. By access to, um, a lot of people who need mental health services don't get them. Um, one in three counties in the US don't have a single licensed psychologist. It's really hard to find effective care and then accessibility of, um, our treatments aren't all that exciting, aren't all that interesting, aren't all that palatable to people. Um, the mean number of sessions that a person attends, even after they overcome all those barriers, um, they find a therapist, they have insurance, they have the resources, they make it to their office. The average number of sessions a person attends is one. Um, and so we've really done a disservice uh, to build these treatments that um, people don't want to use either. And so I think technology has the huge potential to bring treatments to people in places where they can be useful and to make treatments that are more engaging, more interesting, more useful, more palatable to the people who want to use them. That's great. Thank you all. Let's talk about screen time. This is something just that phrase itself is 
something that has different meanings for everyone. But um, let's dig in a little bit to the research and the evidence around screen time and taking this from the lens of parents and teachers as they think about screen time for their kids or their students. Um, Candace, is this something that you think parents should be worried about? It's interesting you say let's talk about screen time because it's actually the thing that is most talked about right among parents and teachers and um, and people that are concerned about how children are doing and I think the interesting part is the conversation about screen time leading up to COVID was really focused on a lot of kind of negative aspects or perceived negative aspects of screen time times and impacts on kids. And I think what we're seeing right now in this moment is a real flipping of the script to focus more on how can we use digital technologies and screen time on screens to more effectively support all these aspects of young people's development. And so people have been arguing for that for, for a while that we need to think about, get away from this idea of counting the number of hours that you spend on, on screens and talk more about what young people are doing, how we can use digital technologies more effectively. But I think in this moment, we're seeing that conversation shift. And it's a good thing that it's shifting. Um, one of the reasons it's a good thing it's shifting is that it actually correlates very poorly with all the child outcomes we measure. So if we just take gross measures of screen time and correlate them with things like mental health, physical health, you know, how kids are doing in school, they're really, really weak relationships when they're there, they're explained by other things. And it's often difficult to tell what's coming first, right? So our young people that are struggling with mental health problems, just using technology differently. And that seems to be the case in the longitudinal research. So I think the, the concept of screen time, people have struggled with that. It's, it's pervasive. But right now in this moment, we're really kind of digging into thinking about how we want to be using screens and digital tech to connect kids. Yeah, the flipping, I feel like screen time was almost a bit of a swear word maybe <laughs> earlier in the year, and now it has a different meaning because it's acknowledged that that's how people connect. Um, Stephen, you mentioned mental health and technology and how those two interact. Can you tell us how youth are making use of different um, digital resources or online apps to support their mental health? Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways uh, youth specifically are using technologies to support their mental health. I'll say that I've spent a lot of time looking at mental health specific technologies, apps and websites and tools that are developed for the, the real purpose of trying to figure out if these things can benefit people's mental health. But in talking to people and talking to youth, um, we often hear about other technologies that they're using, um, you know, going to Spotify and making a Spotify playlist that has songs that kind of help put them in a, a better mood or help kind of put them in a place where they're able to perform. Um, going to their Instagram feeds and creating um, accounts so that it's showing positive images or things that help them get out of a funk. And so I think one thing to sort of note is that for youth, there is an ecosystem of technologies they're interacting with. It's not, you know, one app or one platform or one, um, one place that they're, they're touching technologies. I think at the same time though, we see youth really are interested in these mental health specific um, apps and websites. Um, one report found that of um, youth ages four to 22, about two thirds of them had used a health app and mostly for things that are related to mental health, um, sleep, substance use, stress, anxiety, uh, and that they found these things really useful to them. And so we do find that um, youth are really likely to turn to technology because they're spending so much time interacting through technology already to find ways to kind of support their, their mental health and their mental wellness. Yeah, you mentioned um, Spotify and Instagram up front as a couple of ways that youth are using technologies in addition to specific apps. And Mimi, can you talk to um, social media like Instagram and others how are youth leveraging different social media platforms for support and connection, especially as we've mentioned during this time of COVID? I love this project because it's given me an opportunity and a lens through which to look at online community and digital youth research through the uh, lens of well being and what kind of positive social support online can lead to sort of positive well being outcomes for youth. Uh, so a lot of our research, and there is a very robust literature within uh, sort of ethnographic, qualitative sociology, anthropological work, media studies that really is studying, you know, what 
kids are doing online, not necessarily with a health focus, but when we bet, went back to that research and talked to the researchers in this field and asked them to uh, really think through uh, what the relevance was for these things that we know are helpful for kids, uh, like uh, being, you know, sharing positive uh, communication and support in times of emotional stress and need um, uh, for young people who are um, marginalized socially to find other young people who share their identity and interests. These are all things that online communities and social media really, really support young people to be able to do. And we also know that they have positive benefits in terms of young people's uh, health and well-being. So in the report, we really tried to link up those literatures that don't often talk to each other. And we found some really interesting kinds of what we call genres of social support that young people engage in just as part of being friends and pursuing interests online. Uh, for example, some young people describe how, you know, when they're having a bad day, they'll post something on social media, whether it's a meme or some lyrics from a song and the kind of support that they get from both their friends and other people on the internet uh, to make them feel better. You know, that's something um, social media, emotional management is what one researcher describes it. Another researcher in our project here at Tanksley has been studying uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and how young, um, young people of color are uh, creating these sort of spaces of refuge, often private groups on social media uh, with, uh, you know, young people who share their same political activism and their shared background as sort of protective spaces of healing uh, for them to recover from all of the trauma, black death and dying that they're seeing on the internet and a lot of the hate and harassment that um, the negative things on the internet, young people are also finding positive spaces of social support where uh, identities that might not dominate the conversation online, there are still ways in which they can connect and have their feelings validated and have spaces of healing. Uh, you know, that was something that was really true of um, LGBTQ uh, youth uh, in the early days of the internet, uh, because often young people uh, who are, who don't have people with a shared background uh, in their families or in their schools can reach out to others to have their um, otherwise stigmatized identities validated. And today's uh, online environment offers a lot of opportunities for influencers and other uh, leaders, whether it's uh, uh, you know, around minoritized uh, racial or cultural or uh, sexual orientation identity, identities to have a platform. And even if uh, teens aren't directly interacting with those influencers or celebrities, it is tremendously validating for their identities to see uh, people who are open and proud about certain otherwise minoritized identities uh, on the internet. So those are just a few examples that we found from the qualitative research of how online communities are supporting positive well-being for young people. Stephen, one of the things that has come up for a lot of families during COVID is that pretty much the only way to manage behavior is something like taking away the cell phone as punishment for doing something or limiting their time on social media. So what kind of suggestions do you have for parents for strategies for um, online engagement, specifically during COVID, but overall when life is back to normal, what are some good guidelines? One of the best guidelines I'd offer is, you know, spend time with your kids on whatever medium it is that they're doing. Like if they're on social media, um, sit with them as they go through their social media and understand what they get from it. If they're gaming, play the game with them and understand what they get from it. Um, I think these different technology inputs offer a huge opportunity to have conversations um, with kids around what's meaningful to them, what's fun to them, what they like to do. Um, and I think if we treat this as sort of all good or all bad, or, you know, take it away as the punishment, um, it, it overlooks that it's really nuanced and there's a lot of different things going on there. And so I think that um, as a parent, like trying to understand the nuance from the, the view of a, the, the kids is really important to sort of understand how you can even sort of interact with the, the um, you're a child and also with the technology and how to think about how 
um, to use that sort of appropriately um, to build relationships and build skills and build the different things that can come from technology because it's not all good and it's not all bad. It's, you know, there's a lot of different things going on there. For sure. And I think that connection with your kids is so important, whatever their interest is, right? If it's a certain sport, if it's online, whatever it is to get, get into their space and really connect with them is so valuable. Um, Candice, you mentioned earlier the work you're doing in the research of, of children. And when you said that, I thought, boy, children is a really big, that's a lot of years and a lot of different phases of development. So um, can you break it down for us a little bit with um, suggestions? Stephen had one as far as um, engaging with your kids and getting into what they're doing and seeing what they enjoy. But do you have maybe general guidelines for parents of, say, elementary age kids and then tweens and then teens or college students? Yeah, so I think that's one of the main themes that was embedded throughout the report is we really have to take this developmental lens to thinking about kind of what's the appropriate amount of scaffolding and support from parents, but also from technology companies, right? How much autonomy do you give your children in all kinds of spaces and digital spaces are kind of those new spaces we have to think about. And so for younger children, you tend to see a lot more kind of monitoring in terms of time usage control. Parents have more control at this point over kind of app usage when young people are using. Um, and then as we get into this pre-adolescent period, and this is a, a period that we've studied a lot because it's when you start to see the problems that we've been hearing about so much in terms of increased depression and anxiety first start to come online. And if we took a second, which we do in this report, and look to the digital world, this is also the time when young people are first getting their, their first social media account. They're first starting to explore those spaces online to kind of follow influencers that might speak to issues that they're starting to think about around identity. And so this is a period where parents are actually in the digital space stepping back. They're worried. They think this is a foreign space that they don't know enough about, and that is invoking some panic. Right? But the kind of communication that Stephen referenced is the same kind of communication that will get your children through this adolescence period and this transition, right? So you don't have to be an expert in Instagram or TikTok, but you can talk to your child about kind of what they're doing, what they're enjoying. Um, if you want to join TikTok and, you know, join in the dance, that can be fun. Um, that can be fun too. But it's that period where they're first making that transition. And then you see as young people kind of move through adolescence, they start to develop their own kind of skills and strategies for creating online practices that work for them, that help them to kind of manage their, their kind of mood and, and friendships. And the really, a really kind of interesting and fascinating thing is that there's all these resources that I think we're leaving on the table. So older cousins, older siblings, you know, they're a valuable resource in a family to help in terms of thinking about, you know, what was it like to be 10 years old and first getting, you know, into this space. And so drawing on those in the same way that we're having, you know, grandchildren teach grandparents how to, how to Zoom and Skype um, can actually be an activity in and of itself. So I think it's, it's important to kind of calibrate, you know, where, where your child is on this developmental arc and how much space versus freedom they might need in navigating it. That's great advice from everyone for the family. Thank you for that. So let's shift gears. Um, we've talked about how parents and families interact. Let's talk about this more from the lens of the professional communities for a minute. Um, and that would include health practitioners or developers, which you did mention a moment ago, um, online educators. So these groups are key to addressing um, the mental health and well being, and then also issues like equity and vulnerability for youth in different spaces. So um, Mimi, let's start with you. Do you think the digital learning gap is widening during the pandemic? Yeah, I'm so glad you're raising the issue of equity because I think that's one of the topics that sort of gets buried in all of the panic around screen time and other things that the real risks that I see uh, that are very widespread is the growing equity gap. Uh, when you have more and more uh, young people and schools and, uh, you know, health practitioners adopting new and fancy technologies. So it's well documented in the research that this sort of race to uh, always be, uh, you know, putting forward newer technologies that require more processing power, that require higher bandwidth, 
naturally creates a growing equity gap in uh, education, but also access to health resources and things like that. You take a simple example like, you know, Khan Academy with streaming videos. Uh, in a way, it's a fabulous uh, invention, whether it's uh, massively open online courses or something like Khan Academy to be able to have lectures from really fabulous educators um, on the internet. But if you take into account the fact that there are a lot of kids who don't have reliable internet access at home, much less an all-you-can-eat data plan on their phone, then suddenly that gap between uh, the haves and have-nots in terms of access to information resources has suddenly grown wider because kids who do have that full battery of uh, technical and social support at home are uh, in this rich gets richer phenomenon. So you can have a 12-year-old learning calculus, but you can also have a kid who doesn't have access to even Wi-Fi to do their homework, which has become a standard for many schools. Now, in the pandemic, that gap has just accelerated, uh, which has been hugely uh, problematic, but I think there's also a silver lining, which is that for the first time, the public really understands that digital access is essential to young people's learning and development if it's a baseline for access to basic uh, public resources like education and health, which it has become, whether it's telemedicine or uh, virtual therapy or interacting with their teachers, the public has suddenly realized that what happens in the home environment, digital access in the home environment, it actually matters what young people need to get the kind of support that they really, uh, the social support, the emotional support, those things that we're really looking at in our project, uh, that gap is just huge and it's definitely getting wider. Uh, we've seen that venture capital in educational technology has really pivoted during COVID to be investing much more in the direct-to-consumer offerings, the kind of pay-to-play model, while the public sector really hasn't had a response to how you provide that baseline access to young people from every walk of life. So I think that um, sort of privatization or the pay-to-play uh, uh, model for learning and for health, the concierge health models, uh, for people who have resources, this innovation has been incredibly uh, powerful and helpful, but it's left a lot of families behind. And it sounds like at this point, it's about raising the issue and finding how are we going to come together to solve this? Because it doesn't sound to me like you're seeing any meaningful solutions across the board out there yet. I think that's right. The solutions that we've seen so far are sort of private citizens sort of um, giving scholarship money or trying to create a more inclusive pandemic pod or, you know, helping, it's sort of a, a charity version rather than, you know, a concerted public recognition that these kinds of infrastructures are essential to young people's health and learning. When we think long-term, Stephen, do you, do you have any insight or predictions as far as how COVID is going to affect kids with their long, longer-term health and development? I think it's a really good question. It's a question that's on everyone's mind right now. What is the long-term impact of this pandemic? And in reality, the answer is we don't know. Um, we don't know how long this pandemic is going to last. We don't know how long changes are going to be in place. And so you know, I think that it's hard to figure out what the, the long-term changes will be. I think that one thing that's really sort of important to think about the role technology has to play in sort of providing supports is that there's been a lot of acceleration over the past couple months in light of the COVID pandemic in terms of regulations, in terms of recognition, in terms of acceptance. Um, you know, almost overnight, a lot of health systems that were extremely slow to adopt teletherapy now had, you know, 95 to 100 percent of their sessions being done via teletherapy. And so I think there were there are a lot of um, good learnings that have taken place during this time to think about how technology can play an important role in sort of the well-being of youth. And I think that recognition will sort of further allow there to be conversations around the things that we still need to figure out, um, the, the best uses of these technologies, the challenges of disparities, um, what works and what doesn't, as opposed to thinking about some of the, the really um, the logistical stuff that's really slowed this field for so many years prior to the pandemic. One thing that is 
evident is um, the increase in suicides or adults who are considering suicide during this time. And we know that there's a lot of research going on on the impact on teens and their mental health as well. Just this time when we've all become so much more isolated than we used to be, that is having an impact on mental health for everyone across the board. And Candace, I'm wondering if you have any suggestions as far as um, how we can support teens. The terms um, well-being or mental health have come up a lot. How can we support that during this time? Yeah, so I think one of the um, the things to keep in mind as we go into this is youth mental health was a big issue before the pandemic hit. So we entered into 2020 in crisis um, over youth mental health and rising rates of depression, anxiety, suicide attempts. And so those problems aren't new. And actually, those problems have been with us for a very long time in terms of thinking about how to support it. The pandemic is bringing kind of new shocks to that and new opportunities. And so one of the things is thinking about, you know, this entire generation isn't going to be negatively impacted by the pandemic. Some will thrive, some will have new opportunities, some will be very well supported. But every time, you know, we have a kind of natural disaster or an economic shock or downturn, what we consistently see and what we know is that those in most vulnerable positions, whether that's socioeconomically, whether that's being marginalized and other adventures of their identity, are the hardest hit. So I think the first thing is thinking about kind of what are the risks that young people are bringing into this, you know, for educators and for policymakers, that says in terms of vulnerable groups. And for parents, you know, parents have watched their children for these years growing up to 2020 and know what kind of risks or, or difficulties they might be bringing into this. So children who are already struggling with anxiety or depression, they're going to require a closer eye and more supports. Some of this is withdrawn, right? So the same kind of things we would look for in terms of problems with sleep, in terms of withdrawing from, you know, I would say daily activities, but those are really changed but withdrawing from kind of engagement and those types of things. One of the concerns is that there are just less eyes on young people, right? So there are less teachers or less coaches, there are less family friends. And so we need to think about ways to make, maybe it's digital technology helping with this to develop social safety nets that will help those that are most vulnerable as we go through this. And so for all parents uh, that are out there, kind of these, the, the general things of kind of increased conversations, you know, keeping an eye on the family health and, and the, the health of young people. But as a society, really thinking about who, who are the populations that we need to be investing more in right now so that when we trace these impacts, we don't find those, those, that widening gap and that differential impact in the years to come. So you mentioned some of the different supports that um, we have for these youth. And Stephen, um, your work focuses a lot on the digital support. So can you describe how technology can supplement and extend the services that we find in person in other ways? There's been a lot of work over the past couple of years to develop technologies that take effective science-based practices from effective psychosocial treatments and translate them into digital formats. And I'll say in a lot of places around the world, in Australia, in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Canada, these are frontline treatments. These are recommended resources that people um, get as their first treatment when they present for depression and anxiety. Um, they may not get offered a uh, medication or a therapist first, they get an, an app or a website or a tool to, to help see if this tool can help them to orient them um, to the different skills that you get taught in these psychosocial treatments um, and to do so in a way that is easy to access, easy to use, and easy to learn. Um, there are a lot of tools that are out there that focus on different things that people can download themselves on the app stores, but there's a, there's a lot out there and the, the quality is extremely variable. Um, in our work, we found that there's somewhere between 10 to 20,000 of these mental health apps. Um, not many of them are focused towards youth and adolescents. Um, not many of them are backed by science and evidence, uh, but there are some that are. And so I think that navigating that is a really challenging um, aspect, but um, finding ones that are backed based off of science backed techniques um, that use evidence-based techniques from cognitive behavioral therapy, from meditation and mindfulness practices, from things that we know promote 
well-being, I think is a, a good step to find something that might be useful for people. So as we look ahead from here, do you have any suggestions for the professional community or the development community and how to make those um, more readily available or maybe rise to the top of those 20,000 <laughs> options that people have when they're looking for some resources? Yeah, I think one of my big advice, especially when we think about youth, is that youth need to be involved from the start. Um, you can't develop a tool and assume that youth are going to want to use it and will use it and will help them if youth aren't involved in the process. And so making sure that this is not about taking something that worked in um, adults and taking something that was designed for adults and, you know, putting on some, you know, youth pictures or some different colors and you know assuming that kids are going to like it and kids are going to use it i think that's one um, i think another sort of piece is just going to trusted sources to be able to figure out um, tools that work so uh, people are much more likely to use these resources if recommended by a provider or by a friend or a family member and so i think if you need help going to provider and seeing if there's recommendations, um, I think is a really sort of useful way to do that. And we also run a project called One Mind Cyber Guide where we evaluate some of these tools and provide uh, information on different criteria. We look at the credibility, we look at the user experience, we look at aspects around data security and privacy. And we look at those things separately because those are all different considerations that people might look at differently. Maybe someone wants something that is extremely science-backed. Um, maybe someone is more open to something that is um, a little bit more exploratory as long as it's easy to use and fun and engaging. And so I think that there's not a one-size-fits-all solution here. Um, it's not that there's going to be something that works from every, for everybody, um, but finding places to get information about the tools that are available either through providers, professional communities or through resources like One Mind Cyber Guide is I think a really useful way to learn more about what's out there. Uh, well, thank you all for your time today. We've, we've covered a lot of ground, um, both from the perspective of families and educators and then also the professional community in just learning and understanding. And I think that's what really uh, resonates with me as I hear you all talk about this work is that it's, it's understanding youth and then determining how are we going to meet them where they are and help develop that well being in them. So, um, the paper that you've written certainly dives into that a lot. And I think there are a lot of practical takeaways wherever you're coming from, whether it's from the family side or from the professional side. So, um, thank you for your time. And um, if you'd like to learn more about the report and be able to read in the details and the nuances that Mimi and Candace and Stephen have described, you can visit the website at connectedlearning.uci.edu.